Hello and welcome back. Today we're looking at rule number three of the data draft strategy and that is prioritizing goal scoring wingers over centers early in the draft. So if you missed the last video, we looked at the two elite defensemen strategy and honed in on specifically where to start drafting elite D. So if you missed that video, go check that one out. It should be the second one in this playlist. Quick disclaimer, everything that we're looking at today uh, we're using the rankings uh, that are based on the player hub, which is essentially a category league with uh, standard categories, goals, assists, uh, shots, power play points, hits, and blocks. Uh, so that's what all of the rankings uh, and the player ratings are based off of for this video. But let's get right into it. 38 point per game players this year. That is a little bit uh, down from last season where we had 44. Now, breaking this down is a little bit difficult because players obviously play multiple positions. So I'm doing what I did for the other five seasons here and using Roto-Wire's assigned positions, which are single position instead of uh, multi-position. Now, this year, there were six fewer point-per-game players than last year. One center, two left-wingers, four right-wingers, and one defenseman fewer. Now, centers are still the most prevalent, 44.7% of this 38 player sample size were centers. Obviously 17 is the highest number of centers that hit a point per game uh, in the last six years. 31.5% of these were left wingers. That's 12 out of 38. A uh, little bit down from last year, but still well elevated compared to every other season in this six uh, year sample size. Right wingers are down from last year as well, but they're pretty much right in line with every other season between five and seven. And defenseman is still elevated compared to every other season except last year. Uh, and you did have Eric Carlson and Kale McCarr who were above a point per game this year. Uh, but this shows you the, the breakdown by position of the point per game players in the league. And obviously you want some of those players on your team. But who are these players? So let's take a look at this. These are the point per game players from last year uh, rated by point per game. Now, obviously, last year we saw the highest point per game average for any player since Lemieux in 95-96, 2.3 points per game for Lemieux in that season, uh, which is kind of incredible just to think that I lived through that and didn't realize how amazing that was. But I'm living through this, and this is incredible. I did an entire video on Connor McDavid uh, putting up this historic 1.86 point per game season. Uh, obviously, if you get that first overall pick, you never choose anyone other than McDavid. Uh, and that was cemented this season as well. Now, seven of the top 10 point per game uh, producers are wingers. Only two are pure centers. You have Dreisaitl and Rantanen who are dual position eligible. Obviously, that's a little bit more favorable because you have a little bit more flexibility in getting them into the lineup. Uh, but you're never going to shy away from McDavid or McKinnon. McKinnon with a great season, 1.56 points per game. Uh, and I believe he eclipsed the 100 point mark for the first time in his season, in his career. Uh, and then some of the disappointing players faced injuries, and this is not necessarily a reflection of them being disappointing. Uh, guys like Kaprizov missed time. He would have been much higher ranked than this and probably wasn't disappointing if you owned him, other than the fact that he wasn't available for you down the stretch. Uh, Kale McCarr, same thing, in and out of the lineup. If he was healthy, he would have been uh, probably a top five, top 10 player. Uh, he was number three or four on the data draft player hub overall in the entire league, not just for defensemen. Uh, and then some of these other guys, Buchnevich missed a bunch of time as well. I believe Fiala missed a couple games here and there. Um, there were some disappointing players to an extent. Panarin, still a good player at 62 overall, but he did regress from this uh, third round draft position. Same thing with Barkov. Barkov is a much better overall player in real hockey than he is a fantasy player, but he still put up 1.14 points per game, which was really impressive. Um, but there, you know, you still need to have at least one, if not multiple players on this list if you want a shot to win the championship. And while there are a number of examples of later round picks that vastly exceeded their draft position, guys like Skinner, Hyman, Tuck, Carlson, Thompson, Point, etc., you should definitely target two of these types of players in the first four to six rounds of the draft. Why? Well, let's take a look at this a little bit differently. So this is a bar graph showing point per game players by round. So how many point per game players were there in each round? And what you can see here is, um, oh, by the way, round is based on ADP data only, and only 10 players were ADP 12 or lower. So two goalies, eight skaters, etc. So this was all based on ADP. Uh, and then I just binned that based on, you know, one to 12 was round one, uh, you know, and so on and so forth. So Based on that, 50% of the point per game players were drafted by the end of the third round. Um, that is incredible 
you need to get those point per game guys in the top end of the draft, especially because all of these players are probably well in excess of a point per game. A lot of these guys were 1.4, 1.5 points per game, etc., and you just can't find that later in the draft. However, the 6th and 12th rounds had a lot of point per game guys as well, 9 to be exact, and that comprises 23% of the entire 38 players. So there are pockets in the draft where you can find a ton of value, and that's why I suggest you start taking risks and swinging for the fences in the 6th round and beyond. But what if you're looking for more than just points? How did centers and wingers fare compared to their ADP? This is end rank versus ADP for centers. Now, what you'll notice here, a lot of value centers after the 10th round, uh, especially in the 14th round, there were 10 players that improved based, uh, compared to their draft position. Now, it is easier to improve based on your draft position if you're drafted way later. It's a lot more difficult to do that if you're drafted in the first or second round because there's not a lot of places to go. If you're drafted eighth, you have to go uh, higher than eighth at the end rank. So it's a lot harder to do. Uh, so we will address that in just a second. But not many disappointing centers in this list, only 10 across the entire 16 rounds. So this is support for my claim that you can find valuable centers late in the draft and on the waiver wire, and a lot of these centers are holding up a lot of their value. So you're not going to necessarily swing and miss on a lot of these guys. But what about the other half of that? Are there fewer productive wingers that late? So, you know, is that true? Taking a look at the same graph for left wingers and right wingers, uh, more wingers are drafted in the top six rounds than centers, so there is overlap for multi-positional players, but still, um, there is similar value in those later rounds, the 14th to the 16th round, you can find some wingers uh, that exceed their draft position, but again, this comes uh, as you know, kind of a logical thing. Obviously, if you're being drafted down in this range, you have a higher probability of exceeding your draft position. But there were some guys, guys like Ricard Raquel improved 114 spots from his ADP. Uh, he was the highest riser of the non-center el eligible wingers. He was drafted in the 15th round at 171 and ended up 54th. So that's a massive improvement, and that's one of the players that you can find in this range. Uh, obviously, we just mentioned that there is a problem with this analysis, and obviously, if you're drafted in the back part of this draft, you have a higher probability of improving. So let's look at another analysis to kind of hone in on that. Now, this is the number of, of left wingers and right wingers rated above 70 in each round. So there were 23 wingers that were rated over 70 on the player hub, which is a measure of how complete a player is in standard category leagues with hits and blocks. The majority of those players listed on the right were drafted before the sixth round. As you can see here, there's you know nobody in the sixth or seventh. Everybody in this range, uh, this is the main pocket where you want to find these guys, these guys that are very complete players and point per game guys for the most part. Um, the sweet spot seemingly is the third round. Obviously, a lot of these guys uh, are very productive players, guys like Kachuk, guys like Pasternak, usually Kyle Connor and Jake Gensel. They were a little bit disappointing uh, based on what we saw earlier, but uh, Gensel's a very complete player at an 80.52, and Kyle Connor wasn't bad at all. You know, not as good as he usually is, but still 71.75. So, uh, the sweet spot seems to be that third round to find some of those value wingers. But if you want one of those elite guys, Kucherov, Kaprizov, Kachuk, uh, Marner was a little bit disappointing, but Ovechkin held up most of his value. You have to find them in the first or second round. But let's compare that to centers. And this is where you're going to find the heart of the analysis that we did last year and what we're trying to uh, prove or disprove this year. So this is exactly what I was trying to get at. There's a lot more centers that are above 70 in this back part of the draft. Now, I'll go back and forth so you can visualize it a little bit clearer. This is wingers, where most of this is in the first chunk of rounds in the draft, and then you compare that to centers, where there are still you know excellent centers in the top half of the draft, or the top couple of rounds, but a lot of the value is in the back part of the draft. Um, there are 32 centers rated above 70, while obviously the best centers need to be drafted in that first round, guys like McKinnon, McDavid, etc., there are very complete centers available as late as the 14th to the 16th rounds. In fact, 40% of the players on this list were drafted in that range. And you're looking at some of the best, most complete players in the league, especially if you're trying to uh, stuff you know, categories. Guys like Erickson Eck, he's been trending up over the last couple of years. Uh, that will be another analysis video where we look at a five-year analysis trend of some of these players that are improving. Logan Couture was really complete despite the fact that he was on the waiver wire in my league for most of the season on and off guys were picking him up and dropping him back um, there. You know, Vincent Trocek had a coming out party to an extent. 
uh, a hit a lot. He was a big hitter for the Rangers. He was on PP1 for a majority of the season, getting some shots as well. Uh, and he would be streaky in terms of his production, you know, goal and two assists and then go cold for a couple games. But he was still very complete. Boone Jenner was very complete and he was a waiver option for me for a lot of the season. So there's a lot of this uh, complete uh, players in the back you know, part of this draft, guys that aren't necessarily going to put up 1.5 points per game, but they're going to get you hits or blocks or something else. Uh, so this is uh, the heart of the analysis that we did last year, and we're kind of proving that this year. So let's summarize everything that we just went over. We confirmed that both point per game centers and complete centers are available deeper in the draft. I still don't suggest fading centers in the first round necessarily because you need those elite top end guys like McDavid and McKinnon and Matthews, etc. Elite wingers do seem to need to be drafted before the sixth round for the most part. Now, I found a guy like Carter Verhage off the waiver wire. He ended up being a 40 goal scorer. So you can find those on the waiver wire and you can find them late in drafts, but you don't want to bank on that. You need to have one or two of those wingers and you probably should bank on getting them before the sixth round because of what we just saw. Uh, remember, always adjust all of this analysis to your league format and your scoring system. Otherwise, you're going to be tr you know, spinning your wheels. This is all based on category leagues with standard categories and shows how complete a player is. And we just saw their point per game averages. But if you have different weightings for goals, assists, shots, etc., you're going to have to you know, adapt all of this to your league format. But that's going to do it for this one. If you made it to the end, I want to thank you for doing that. Remember to like and subscribe. It really helps the channel. Obviously, this is the dead season where I'm not getting any views. But if you're here watching, I want to thank you for that as well. Uh, follow on Instagram for more content. And as always, I'll see you in the next one.